So in part three of this week's content, we're uh, talking to Megan Sharp, who's joining us again from the University of Melbourne. Um, and we're talking about the uh, hospitality project that we've um, that we've been talking about for a couple of weeks in the course. And Megan's going to talk about a paper that she led as um, part of the team about the queer sub subjectivities of work. So Megan, can you um, start off by telling us uh, why this is an important issue in um, thinking about young people's work lives, the ways that um, the uh, labour market and the way that hospitality kind of relies on particular cohorts of people to create vibes or politics or aesthetics and stuff like that that are attractive for people to attend. Mm -hmm. um, and just talk a little bit about that, those aspects. Yeah, sure. Hello again, everyone. <laughs> um, I'm back. Um, okay, so this research, I was really interested to hear from queer people who work in hospitality and then have a think about how we imagine both the workplace and queer people's labour. So there's two kind of ideas that I'm interested in there. When you look at research about queer people at work, uh, the workplace seems to be a really kind of homogenised idea. There's no, there's not a lot of research that distinguishes different kinds of work. Uh, so a lot of what we know about, about queer people, and really it's LGBTIQA people at work, is about how to increase their productivity in the workplace because they're generally um, oppressed or feel marginalised or feel like they can't bring their whole self to work. That really is challenged by what we found in the research about hospitality, where, in fact, bringing yourself to work is quite valuable in a hospitality setting, especially when you're a front of house hospitality worker. And in places some like settings, in some settings, yeah. in some settings, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, in Melbourne, it's uh, fairly common that queerness is. Um, quite valuable, quite uh, quite a kind of resource yeah, that yeah, venues draw on. Yeah, there's a capital in it that venues draw on in order to, you know, tell consumers that they're a safe place um, or at least have that veneer uh, yep. that of safety um, to sell products, to sell the vibe, to, like, be cool as well. There's a coolness that's associated with queerness. Um, which the queer body kind of um, makes possible or generates in certain spaces. Yep. Um, the other thing I think is uh, queer people tend to, or they reported in this research that a lot of what they do at work about creating a kind of positive consumption experience is about their biography as a queer person um, not necessarily wholly because of their skill as a hospitality worker, right, and that um, their history and understanding of gender and sexuality and also relationships and intimacy and pleasure and all of that is um, really important to how they create consumption experiences for, for clients, for, for um, patrons, that are really welcoming and that make patrons feel at home and feel safe and feel like this was the best experience ever. So they're like creating an experience out from how they understand the world as, as kind of queer people. Yeah. So the, um, in, in the earlier parts of the lecture with Julia Coffey, we we're talking about how, you know, femininity is kind of enrolled into the work in terms of those forms of emotional and different kinds of labor that young women are expected to do. So it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy in the sense that, the like the labor of that is kind of expected and therefore they're also so seen as kind of better at it mm. um and the kind of bringing the whole sense of self and their kind of senses of kind of um being in the world as a woman becomes a way of kind of scanning for risks and all that kind of stuff mm. i'm saying here there's a similar thing is going on but there's kind of an extra layer of kind of value but also risk that happens in these spaces as well attached to queerness mm -hmm. yeah definitely but you know some of the participants talk about being working in particular venues where they don't want to be out because it is risky. Um, they can't be sure that their co-workers, that their management, that customers 
are going to be um, yeah. welcoming towards that. Yeah. So in terms of the kind of taste consumption stuff that we've been looking at in the course, it's kind of kind of getting at before when you were saying um, it's kind of value and capital in some venues and it can kind of, there's even aspects of empowerment and that kind of stuff that can happen in those spaces, mm. particularly in spaces that like also actively promote themselves as being left-leaning and all that kind of stuff and mm. um, have particular theme nights or, or stuff like that. That can be a real thing. On the other end of the spectrum, um, yeah, there's still the kind of same discrimination that happens in these spaces that um, that is, you know, marginalising and violent. Um, so there's kind of, yeah, a, a kind of spectrum of experiences that we've kind of found in this um, in this research that replicates a lot of the kind of usual inequalities. We've also found some other interesting aspects of as, as well, the way that kind of, you know, different forms of gender or sexuality create value mm. that the workers kind of know about and can exploit in some sections, but feel kind of a bit weird about it other times because it's kind of challenging. So that blurriness between work and leisure and, you know, life mm -hmm. life and labour and all that kind of stuff is kind of very mm. present in the in the stuff we're talking about here. Yeah, totally. And it, it buys into that idea that, um, you know, the, the, the kinds of sexualities that are normal are those which are public and heterosexuality is really public, um, you know, there's there's not a lot of stigma around heterosexuality in a in a public sense, and but there's something about queer people being public with their sexuality that makes them inspirational or so brave or you know yeah. all that kind of stuff. And part of that is also built into to kind of consumption to pride and things like that. So yeah. in relation to that, tell us a little bit about this idea of tolerant cosmopolitanism. Yeah, so tolerant cosmopolitanism is written about by, uh, there's a bunch of research about it, mostly from places like uh, human geography, um, emotion studies, and affect as well, um, where the idea is that you consume something and in that consumption practice you are um, there's values and there's ethics in the thing that you're consuming um, and that you can kind of prove your allyship through your consumption, right? So you might be a person who considers themselves to be an ally to the queer community. You might go to the queer bar to order drinks. You might go and, you know, go to like a, a an alternative kind of cafe with queer workers and um, have lunch. And all of that is like signaling that you are an ally, that you're, you know, tolerant, that you're accepting of, of the queer community. Um, but that in itself is also used in lots of, lots of tourism campaigns. I mean, Melbourne, for example, is kind of has built itself, its tourism campaign on being alternative, being cool, being cutting edge, being progressive. Everyone's welcome. It's very diverse. So you need those bodies to take up those positions so that people can actively engage with yep. this idea. So whole cities, right, can be tolerant in terms of their cosmopolitanism. And I think Melbourne is a good example of that. However, that's, it only goes so far, right? There's like a limit by which you will be tolerated. So a lot of the people in our research talked about how, it's great to be queer at work, be flamboyant, be fun, be like jazzy and dancy and like everyone's gay best friend. But don't talk about politics. Don't talk about the like same sex marriage debate. Don't talk about anything that's kind of divisive because that doesn't produce tolerance. That produces, you know, like tension. Yeah. Um, and so that is what Duggan calls kind of hetero, uh, sorry, homonormativity, where yeah. you can just be a palatable gay person. Just be, don't be too trans or too non-binary enough that people can still understand you and that they feel cool and they feel good about themselves if they buy something from you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's kind of, yeah, it's like a queer luminosity is fine in certain places, but not so much if you're kind of then talking about like the, discrimination experience or a particular political issue. Yeah, I think that's um, a really good way. And that really, to think about it, and it bears out in the um, the quotes we're about to talk about. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So there's kind of, yeah, this intolerance in conceptually itself, like it implies that 
yeah, I don't really want anything to do with you that much, but I'll, you know, I'll let you exist mm. kind of stuff. There's a there's an actual interesting orientation and a both emotional but a political one because tolerance itself has been at the heart of things like, you know, multiculturalist ideas and stuff like that that also are quite critical in that sense. It's not acceptance. No. Tolerance and acceptance are two different things. So I think that's an important um, distinction to make here. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think this that last point about trans women is a good one just to um, yep. talk about too because, you know, in that starting by Irving, and it speaks to what Julia Coffey talks about too, which is about like certain kinds of femininity meeting the requirements of what is expected in a consumption experience. Um, Irving's study found that trans women, because of their status, because of their um, gender performativity, uh, they weren't considered to be competent in their femininity because their femininity didn't look like the kind that would, um, that was, you know, normal or would be tolerated yeah. right yeah 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 totally okay so um do you want to take us through the the data mm. quotes now so this one's about like doing queer at work yeah so not being yeah. queer, doing beer yeah, doing queer <laughs> doing beer as a Freudian sleep about hospitality yeah <laughs> doing doing queer yeah yeah totally um <laughs> so ben was really interesting to talk to and had heaps of great stuff to, to sort of say about working in a cafe and um, talked a lot about having to put it on, like put on your queerness um, and be flamboyant and be um, friendly and really overt in your queerness because, you know, it sort of says a flaming homosexual because that's like the stereotype that can be understood as a gay man working in um, front of house hospitality. But he's like, you know, that is such an act that is so much labour to put on. Um, Even though, you know, he is a gay man, he's like, I'm not like that. Like I actually am just a quiet little guy. I like having a cup of tea at the end of the day. I like being kind and gentle. Being like overt and really flamboyant is a lot of work for me um and so he doesn't he didn't feel like he could fulfill the expectation that his employer had put on him to be the really like the gay best friend to everyone yeah. so what um, kind of place was where, where was ben working at again ben was working in like a um suburban cafe so it was outer suburbs of newcastle um and quite working class i would say but lots of, he kind of describes like the school run um, being his yep. biggest clientele, like young parents dropping their kids off to public, uh, to primary school. Yep. Um, and lots of like, um, uh, maybe like there was like car yards around the area and yeah, people coming to get like a lunchtime takeaway before they kind of go back to their corporate-ish job yeah okay um what's ryan saying here in regards to a broader scope yeah so a bunch of the participants talked about how being queer gives them a broader scope that was a term that they used much like what julia talks about in uh, you know managing violence um for women who work in hospo Queer people feel similarly, that their biographies as queer people have informed the way that they understand the world, the way that they can read people. Um, And Ryan kind of talks about he feels like he can read people's body language and their demeanour better because he grew up gay and so he was always kind of on the edge of hostility and managing Mm -hmm. risk. He um, grew up in Western Sydney he felt like being a gay man was quite, um, it was uncommon uh, that there was, anyone was out. And so he's got this real feeling of like, you know, surveying always to make sure that he can intervene should there be the slightest amount of hostility towards him. But at the same time, if there is hostility towards him, he is always in his mind going, is that because I'm gay? You know, it might have not have anything to do with him being a gay guy, but in his mind, he's like, 
do these straight guys not like me because I'm a gay guy? Because that's part of how he kind of has understood himself in the world and and how masculinity works, right? Yeah. Like, so again, it's kind of, it relates to the bringing the kind of self to work. It relates to kind of how you interact with others. The scanning of kind of risk becomes inherent because you've lived in an existence where you're at kind of higher risk to a, a bunch of different kind of violence, forms of discrimination yeah. and violence. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it kind of it's not easy to turn on or off, right? It's like, and then if you're in a situation, yeah, it's hard to, even though he says he feels like he can interpret this stuff in a way that's pretty good. It's always a bit confusing and particularly more confusing when it's brought into the work situation where mm. there's a bunch of other kind of institutional, you know, rule-based demands that kind of, you know, make it harder to deal with in many ways. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So oh, yeah. visibility and education, Ash. Yeah. Yeah. Ash is great. They work in Melbourne. They're a non-binary person. Um, they work at like a, a dive bar. Um they talk about how when you're visibly queer, you will often get patrons approaching you to talk about queer stuff. And that is actually enrolled into part of the way that you work and your actual working practices, right? That if you're a bartender, I mean, part of the trope about, about being a bartender is that you're kind of the ear, you know, you're everyone's, um, some people call them babysitters. Yeah, you know, but this idea that being overtly queer or visibly queer opens you up for whole, you know, big kind of conversations around your own sexuality because you have presented that way at work, and it's like you're kind of it's part of that consumption experience. And Ash talks about just being completely exhausted by that. Like they can't look any different in the workplace that's just their aesthetic that's how they look and that's all that they suit the place you know in terms of who else goes there and who hangs out there and the kind of vibe and the affect of the place but the offside of that that they're not getting remunerated for is yep. these intense conversations that they're having to have with people who you know have clocked them basically yeah and if you're if you're the consumer in a bar, like, and someone tries to do this to you, you can kind of get away, right? You can exactly go to the toilet or go and get another drink, but like they're trapped and kind of the yeah. object. Of it. So, and this is there's, there's, there's different examples of I think from memory. Like sometimes it's kind of straight people that seem to have all of a sudden discovered queer politics and want to be the ally and know more about it. And there's kind of that kind of emotional labour. Then like, tell me about this, and I'm on that. And then there's kind of these examples here that there's like, let's talk about this thing that we have in common when you're at work, like. You know, that's mm. seems a bit beyond the pay yeah. yeah. And it depends on the venue, right? Like how you get how there's a how you're gonna mitigate that. Like some participants were like, I just have to do that. I have to just talk about that because, you know, that's part yeah. of my job. I don't have a choice. Whereas other participants who had really inclusive or really like supportive managers, like one of them talked about how they just sprayed a um patron with the water from the little drink hose because that was the kind of bar it was right and the manager would actually think that was really funny because it was like dude if you know if you don't want to get sprayed with the water hose shut up yeah yeah and again i think the key thing to point out here is straight people don't get asked to talk about heterosexuality right so there's like a yeah, totally there's kind of that kind of thing going on too okay yeah so um and again I, and, and relating back again like the, you mentioned their management's really important in these situations so uh, queer workers in these situations will feel much better about these kind of interactions if they know they're supported by management in the venue, um, similarly to the way the kind of women experience sexual harassment and be able to deal with in a place where they're supported. Um, it really makes mm. a big difference in that sense. So, okay, so we're talking about queer labour, queer value here. Mm. Tell us a little bit about this in terms of hospitality. Yeah, I mean, I think this relates back to the tolerant cosmopolitanism thing. Um what I'm trying to get at in this section of the paper is to think through the ways that queer people labour or how what kinds of practices on top of the work that they're already are being asked to do, um, you know, what's being enacted in those spaces and how might how are they being exploited? Like how are queer people's how is queer people's labour being exploited in the workplace? not remunerated and also not supported meaningfully when something does go really wrong. So, yeah. you know, when queer people experience uh, violence in the workplace, 
um, oftentimes, no matter how diverse and inclusive a venue is, they do not have the support there to be able to negotiate that kind of issue. Um, yeah. You know, I recently talked to a participant who was, um, you know, like physically kind of harassed by a patron and the bar were like, well, what did you, what, how, why did you incite that? Yeah. You know, like, because this person is so visibly gay, uh, like, like dyke really butch presenting, the bar were like, well, you must have done something. Yeah, why didn't you manage your present presentation of self in a way that totally. avoided that presentation? Like, totally. you know, very much like what we, what you're wearing kind of discourse. Yeah, in, yeah kind of for sure. Yeah. yeah, definitely. And I think um, that's such an important consideration. Like, it's, it's important for policy, right? Like, mm -hmm. when, when there's policy being made about um, safety in workplaces, I think having yeah. a bit of more of an intersectional lens is what I'm trying to uh, contribute to with these arguments. Yeah. Okay, to sum up, um, yeah, tell us a little bit about this notion of inclusion and how it relates to effective labour. And I suppose you can see here how inclusion in that sense is very much like tolerance in a way. It's kind of mm -hmm. can be twisted and used in various ways that suit certain ends. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's also um, it gets used as if a place can call itself inclusive as if a venue can say we're an inclusive venue, but they don't get to say that. You know, the only way that inclusion gets to be judged is by and from the people that you're attempting to include, right? Yep. It's like I don't get to say I'm inclusive. Everyone else gets to judge how they feel around me and that will tell me whether I'm inclusive or not. Yep. Um, and I think there needs to be a bit of a reorientation around diversity and inclusion politics, Um because I don't think that is acknowledged. I don't think it's I think it's I think it's not acknowledged that inclusion isn't static, and it's not something you can name yourself. Um, yeah, and like the thing is that filling out the forms and getting the stickers right is just a bureaucratic yeah. process. It's once you've got them up, there's still a lot of work to do. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and and also like, you know, having all those stickers around the place, and then only having. Um, men's bathrooms and women's bathrooms does yep. not an inclusive venue make right? yeah yeah so how does and to really finish how does this relate to kind of effective labor it's been a key the different forms of labor have been a key thing we've been talking about over the past few weeks yeah um, like that kind of subjectivity of coming to work brought into work yeah well i think there's a sense that um you know in the service industry, particularly where uh, diversity and inclusion has started to become part of the discourse around how a, a, an organisation should operate, um, yep. affect and affective labour is kind of what produces diversity and inclusion. Like it's the, the ether, right, that makes yep. an organisation and diverse or inclusive but the thing about it is that it requires the body uh to and the biography to engage with also the non-human the space and yeah. the, the politics and whatever else so i think um in terms of affective labor there's a question for me about how that theory has been generated <laughs> under the assumption that heterosexuality is the, is the norm, is the mainstream. Yep. Um, and I like to think, I like to stick with affective labour and wonder what it would, what that theory would look like if queer people had have written it, right? Yeah. Like I wonder yeah. how that would change um, in, a, and, and in a contemporary time of conjecture, right, where people, marginalised folks are, are at once being tolerated and revered and valued and also having their rights taken away from them um, yep. by making healthcare inaccessible or, you know, all that kind of stuff. So that's yep. what I would say as my end point. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks again for joining us. So I'll uh, stop it there. No, Thanks. you're so welcome. Thank you.